Well, with me now, we do have some guests with us. I have Nigel Nelson and also Mo Lovett, who are joining us to go through the papers. So let's go straight to them now. There they are. So by magic, they just appear there. It's great to have both of you here um, with us. There's so much to go through, actually. A uh, very packed Sunday morning. Um, Nigel, let me start with you. Let's head straight for the Sunday Telegraph. The Chief of Defence Staff, Admiral Sir Tony Radiking, very critical of the government's uh, move to bring in the army to replace striking workers. Um, what's your take on this? Well, it's quite quite clear that our, our top military man doesn't like the, the idea of the armed forces being used as strike breakers. Uh, so what he's really saying is, is saying is, look, um, this mustn't become a, a, a kind of, a, a kind of normal way of dealing with things. You can't go around using soldiers just as spare capacity when uh, other workers are on strike. Now, what we're going to see this coming week is, is 1,200 members of the armed forces forces will be standing in for uh, for strikers. 600 of them will be out there driving ambulances. Uh, another few hundred will be checking passports when Border Force start their eight-day strike on Friday. Um, but I do think he's got a point that the we, we can't keep just calling on the, uh, the armed forces to step in when people are, are stopping work. Now, I can understand if it's something that's life-threatening uh, quite clearly Clearly, you need some kind of emergency backup, and only the armed forces can really provide that. But there is a danger of this kind of, of a bit of mission creep, to use their language. And we start sort of using them for things like train strikes or whatever. And I think that's the kind of um, shot that, that um, uh, Sir Tony is firing at the government, saying, please don't do that. Absolutely. And, and, and Mo, uh, moving on, um, sticking with that theme of strikes anyway, a war of words certainly breaking out then between the Prime Minister and the RCN, the Royal College of Nursing. And so the front page of the Observer there, nurses pledge tough new strikes as NHS crisis deepens, giving the um, government 48 hours basically to respond to them. But I think the big question here is, is this a fight that Rishi Sunak really wants to take on? I mean, I don't think it is, is it? I mean, the government's not exactly the most popular government in history at the moment. And, um, you know, we've had it crisis upon crisis, uh, you know, th throughout the country. So um, so I suppose, in a sense, the RCN are in quite a powerful position. Um, what they've done is they've threatened more um, and more severe strike action with nurses offering less generous support in the new year if an agreement isn't reached uh, by Thursday. Um, and so they're really putting pressure on, on ministers to kind of come to the table and reach a, reach an agreement. But like you say, it's not necessarily something that I think Sunak can win. Certainly, we've seen that in the polls, um, it seems to be about 60% of the public back, back the strike action. Um, and, uh, you know, nurses are such a vital part of, part of, you know, people's society's needs, really. And I know there are, you know, you have to have sympathy for people who need the support of nurses at the moment. And, uh, you know, there have been some Terrible examples of, of people's, um, you know, waiting a long time to get uh, seen in hospital and, and GP appointments and all the rest of it. But I think it's really important to remember this crisis in the NHS wasn't caused by the strike action. You know, the fact we have a crisis in the NHS isn't solely a kind of, you know, very contemporary issue. It's been a long time in in the making, and obviously COVID kind of added to those burdens. So yes, the RCN are saying there will be more strike action in the new year if the government doesn't come to the table and reach an agreement by Thursday. Thursday. Absolutely. It's, it's interesting you mentioned about the fact that obviously COVID certainly exacerbated the problems um, leading to the strikes. And that leads me on to the next story regarding COVID, um, Nigel. Just, just reading this headline causes a bit of confusion. You know, anybody who reads this, you pay inmates to destroy wasted PPE. So this doesn't do very much, does it, when it comes to that scandal surrounding PPE contracts and COVID kits, etc. Just help us make some sense of this, of why prisoners are getting paid £3.50 a, a day of our taxpayers' money to destroy wasted PPE. 
Yeah, pretty, I mean, it is pretty appalling, isn't it, Vanessa, on the basis that um, they've, they've, the, the government's already spent £9 billion on PPE, which was either uh, substandard, defective, out of date, and they made a, a huge number of mistakes here. So what they've been doing with it is they've been storing it in warehouses around the country, and they've now got to find some way of getting rid of it. So they've, uh, they've found three um, prisons where uh, the jailbirds there are, are getting paid three pounds pounds 50 a day to dismantle this surplus PPE. I mean, I do think that the, the public inquiry is going to have to look quite quite closely at this. A, obviously, how the contracts were awarded, which is a huge controversial issue, but also about the, the amount of wasted money that went, that went into this. Um, it, it, ju it just seems to be that the... Uh, you can understand the government panicking at the time. They had to try and get source PPE from anywhere they could get it uh, in the face of huge world demand. But the checks and balances don't seem to have actually applied as they should. And hence now they're struggling to find a, find a way of, of, of getting rid of the whole stuff. It's just, it's, it's just, the mind boggles, doesn't it, when you just look at some of the decisions that were made. And I can see you there, Mo, just shaking your head on this. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. Um, you know, I think across all of the stories today, we, you know, we see this um, sort of um, theme of a, a political establishment in crisis, really. And I don't just mean the, the present government. I think, you know, we know that the country feels a little bit broken, quite frankly. And um, we just seem to have a political class that don't don't seem to be able... I mean, you can forgive them a little bit, you know, in, in, you know at the beginning of the COVID crisis when people were, were kind of reacting to the news as it was coming in. Uh, but that was a long time ago now. And, uh, you know, the, the ability of the government uh, and the political class in general to kind of meet the challenges that us ordinary people face uh, seems to be waning by the year, I think. Uh, and Mo, let me stay with you then for the next story. So the front page of the Sunday Express, Home Secretary, no more scandal um, tra channel, sorry, um, tragedy. So Swella Braverman, they're vowing um, to end um, the migrants by crushing, as it says here, evil criminal gangs and one makes you wonder well what kind of secret formula is it that she has that successful governments haven't actually managed and indeed her governments for the last 12 plus years that they've been in power yeah, absolutely. I mean, it does come in the wake of this terrible news that four migrants died crossing uh, the channel this week. Um, Suella Braverman said she will not rest until this issue of illegal migration is tackled. But like you kind of suggest in your tone there, Vanessa, um, you know, this is an issue that's been going on for a long time and successive uh, governments have not been able to solve it. I mean, I think partly the problem is um, that... Um, th th I don't know that people take it seriously. On the one hand, there are incredibly vulnerable people who are looking for a better, uh, you know, better life somewhere somewhere else. On the other hand, there are strains and stresses on ordinary people in terms of services. Uh, if we if we do kind of have un uncontrolled immigration, so it's it's a, it's an argument that has nuance. And I think again, it speaks to this thing of like we need to be able to really say what is it what is it that we mean when we want democratic control of our borders, but. Um, this is a um, swell of Braverman talking tough, I guess, and we also understand from the article in the Express that Sunak has made Channel Crisis his top priority as well. He's apparently embedded in a kind of 400-page report to look at some solutions to the problem, uh, and that will include things like, I suppose, tackling criminal gangs um, through the use of drones, through the use of increased messaging, uh, and uh, basically the Home Secretary says she wants no more illegal entry, no more un controlled immigration and no more tragedies. It's tough talk, but it, you know, it remains to be seen whether or not they can actually get a grip on this because, um, like I said, you know, there are, there are, you know, people who want to come here who go through the correct channels and they keep getting put to the back of the queue because of this, this crisis in the channel. So in one sense, it definitely does need to be tackled. On the other hand, I have to say my faith in the government to tackle it is not necessarily as strong as I wish it was. So they're probably ju just talking the talk, but not actually able to walk the walk um, there. Um, Nigel, let me come to you. We are running out of time and I wanted more time to talk about this, but the Sussexes, the front page of the Sunday Times, I don't know if you've seen those Netflix documentaries, but obviously what really comes out of it is the relationship with the press or lack thereof. So 
looking at this front page, you know, Sussex is one um, to address the TV grievances, they want an apology. Uh, where does this story come from? Have they really said that? What's going on? Do we believe anything anymore? Well, <laughs> I mean, it comes from their royal correspondent, who's got some pretty good sources. Um, but it does seem a bit of a nerve of, of Harry and Meghan after after trashing the royal family on their Netflix documentaries to now say they want to come back and discuss their grievances with them. Uh, now, the idea is they want to sort of try, try and bury the hatchet in time for the coronation in May, uh, which they're planning to attend. But the, the, the whole thing, after you've been whining away, um, complaining about the royal family, having a go at, uh, at Harry's brother William, having a go at his father, uh, it does seem a bit of a nerve. I mean, I do like the palace comment that um, Roy and Nicka has, uh, uh, has come up with from a source there, uh, and they say that uh, if they want to get in touch with the king, they know Nigel. where he lives. <laughs> Nigel, thank you so much indeed for your time. We've run out of time, but yes, of course, looking at the article, more unnamed um, secret sources. Hopefully we should get to the um, bottom of that. But thank you guys so much. We'll see you in the next hour. And I'll see you after this short break.